goes. Uh, and it's so very true that our society has gotten to the point where it just poo poos just about everything. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's no big deal. Why? Because it started out with Elvis swinging his hips uh, back in the 50s and they wouldn't even show it from the waist down uh, until now they show it from the waist up and nothing but the waist doing almost anything measured. What's the problem? I know maybe I said that awkwardly, but your imaginations get the picture. What is the problem? The problem is that the answer for satisfaction is not found in more. Because you see, it's a paradox. It's a conundrum. It's, a, it's, it's an odd thing. But the, the more we receive of something, the less satisfied it becomes. Right now, I'm craving catfish. I'm looking forward to going home to get some good late caught cornmeal battered catfish with some good cornbread hush puppies. But you know what? If I go home and that's all I have is cornbread and hush puppies for breakfast and for lunch and for supper, by the time the third or the fourth day comes, I'm going to be going to the fridge and saying, hey, is there anything else in here? Why? Because it will reach a point of diminishing returns. And can I say that's a silly little example, but it is the same way with everything in your life. The more you receive of a certain thing, the less its ability to stimulate you. <coughs> It, it sounds weird what I'm about to say to you. But the way to receive more. Somebody say more. more. The way to receive more stimulation out of the pleasures in your life is actually to experience them less. Somebody say less. less. You hung on there with me. Most some of you did through the whole statement. And the way to live is to die. The way up is the way down. The Scripture sometimes teaches something that doesn't make sense to the human understanding, but in God's way of wiring us, it is so very true. The only way you're going to learn to experience something fully to its greatest ability to satisfy you is not to engage in it 24-7. And so we see one of the fruit of the Spirit, love. Love is wonderful. Joy, oh, it makes me at peace. Want to be peace. Long suffering. Well, I don't like that one so much. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Now, how did that one get stuck in there? <laughs> now, if I was watching Space down in Houston, you know, Mr. Smiley, uh, Osteen, you know who I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. You know, the guy that just a few weeks ago went on television or at his church, whatever you call it, and, and, and rebuked the apostles basically for their stance on some things and said they were wrong. If I were him, I'd say it was probably an error that really shouldn't be in there because self-control is not pleasing. Self-control is not fun. Saying no is only enjoyable if you're doing it to somebody else. It's no fun when someone tells you no, you cannot have a fourth piece of cake. No, you cannot have your, you know, sixth chicken quarter. No, it's not okay to have your seventh hamburger. No, it's not okay to watch an R-rated movie. Or it's not okay to watch an X-rated movie. Or it's not okay to watch a triple X-rated movie. No, it's not all right. And our world thinks so little of this stuff. You have to be on guard. So Carefully. Because the world is always trying to push more, more, more. Where God has said the answer to finding love and joy and peace and all these things uh, is self-control. Why? Because if you don't have self-control, you cannot be faithful. If you don't have enough control over your body to get up and get out of bed and go to church the same way you get up and go to work, uh, you're not going to be faithful to the house of God. If you don't have enough self-control to pay your tithes to God uh, as much as you do to pay your light bill, you're not going to be faithful to God in your finances. Uh, if you don't have enough self-control to be good to somebody when they've done you wrong. You're not going to have the fruit of the Spirit of goodness. If you don't know how to get control of your tongue and keep it on a leash and not say what's going through your head, 
said, you're not going to be kind to people if you don't have self-control. You're not going to suffer long. You're going to suffer short. Because you ain't going to put up with none of that. If you don't have the fruit of self-control, the anger, and the uncontrolled desires, the uncontrolled impatience, the uncontrolled desires of the flesh will rob you of joy. It will rob you of love. It will rob you of peace. Church, hear me this morning. I'm talking about the forgotten fruit of the Spirit, but it's the fruit that gives you the ability to enjoy the fruits, the good things that God has. Moderation doesn't get a lot of airtime these days. Everything is presented in extremes. We have extreme sports, extreme deodorant, extreme energy drinks, extreme team Bible. Why is everything marked as extreme? Because we bought into the concept that if it's not at the edge, if it's not at the extreme, it's not going to satisfy. Now that's, an, you know, that's an amen point. Amen, Brother Duncan. That's good preaching, Pastor. Because you know what? If you don't get a hold of this concept, you're not going to be satisfied. Temperance. The word sosphrini in Greek. Moderation in action, thought, feeling, or restraint. It has been studied by philosophers, religious thinkers, and psychologists. It is a concept that is considered a virtue, a core virtue that can be seen consistently across time and across cultures. It is considered one of the six main categories of character strengths. It is generally defined by control over excess. So that in many such classes, such as abstinence, chastity, modesty, humility, prudence, self-regulation, forgiveness, mercy, each of these involves restraining some impulse, such as sexual de desire, vanity, or anger. Can I tell you something this morning? We have bought into a concept, and I'm not going to start pushing for two services on a Sunday. I'm not going to start trying to have five midweek services. But can I tell you something? We have bought into a lie, and we have bought into the concept that living for God is showing up on Sunday. Hello? And if you bought into the concept that living for God is, is, is showing up on Sunday in a midweek Bible study, can I tell you, you still have, where is God on Monday? Where is God on Tuesday? What's He doing on Wednesday and Friday and Saturday? Where's He at Saturday night and Friday night? Where's God the rest of your week? If He's not actively influencing your life, then you put Him on a shelf for the week. And can I tell you that God that I serve is not happy being in a box. He doesn't want to be in a mason jar. He's not a pretty flower to stick into a pasta to fire on Sunday and Wednesday and drag out and parade around like he's a badge of honor. But our God is a living God. A God that wants to live in you, to breathe in you. He is what is supposed to motivate your hands and your feet and your mouth and your mind. Temperance is considered one of the four cardinal virtues. For it is believed that no virtue could be sustained in the face of the inability to control oneself if that virtue was opposed to some desire. One drink doesn't stop the pain and so people become drunks. I know what I'm talking about. I took my first sip at 17. By the time I was 19, I had a fight with a girlfriend. That was before I was in church. And it wasn't Sister Duncan. She was a beautiful young lady that other people were, were dating. Shame on them, but she was mine. Just, they didn't know it yet. She didn't. <laughs> I had a fight with a girlfriend. And so what did I do? I went out and bought a Captain, bought a Captain Morgan Spice Drum. And you know what? It wasn't one drink. It wasn't two drinks. I drank the whole stinking bottle in about 45 minutes. I don't remember the ending. I just know I woke up in different clothes the next morning because I had thrown up all over myself and my friends dragged me into the shower and changed my clothes. That 
that's, despre- that's depressing. It's sad. It's sickening. But you know what? One drink doesn't do it. One smoke doesn't do it. One pill doesn't do it. One needle doesn't do it. One affair doesn't do it. One look at porn doesn't do it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you don't learn some self-control, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to be satisfied. Now, let me back up and I want to reiterate something I said a few weeks ago as I was taking a swing at the nail. You don't moderate sin. Okay? So, those some of those things I just mentioned right there, there's no acceptable amount of them. But the devil will tell you, oh, just participate a little bit and it'll bring you satisfaction. That is a lie. Can I tell you something? Anything that you do, I don't want to phrase this. It's not in my notes. Anything that you do that you wouldn't be happy to come to church on Saturday morning and, and, and talk to Jesus after service up here, shake His hand and say, hey, you know what I had such a good time doing the other day? It probably is something you might want to reconsider. Whether it be in moderation or in excess. I read the other day in a, in a book, so I can't remember where it was I read it. But it made the statement that people for years uh, have tried to find satisfaction in the, ex- in the excesses of, of drugs and alcohol, in the excesses of sex, uh, and in the excesses of the crowds. Uh, you get with, figure out which one of those applies to the preacher. All three of them do, just like anybody else. But can I tell you something? If I get my satisfaction, uh, if I X out drugs and I, uh, you know, I, I X out extramarital sex, uh, if I still find my satisfaction uh, by how big the crowd is on Sunday morning uh, and how much response you give to me when I preach, uh, then I have missed the mark. Hey, can I tell you something? The mark of achievement in your life is not determined by the, the extremes that you are able to reach. Eve chose the wrong fruit. And so often when we're faced with choices, we do as well. We tend to err in seeking for greater and greater stimulation. I want to read something to you here. I couldn't remember it all. I didn't take the time to outline it like I usually do. So allow me to kind of just read through this little article for you. An illuminating example can be found in ancient Rome. The great battles of the Colosseum, made famous in movies like The Gladiator, began on a much smaller scale. The tradition started as a way to celebrate the funerals of important men. I didn't know that. Did you know that? Two prisoners would fight to the death, and whoever killed his opponent first was free. The battles grew in number and intensity as military officials and politicians competed to put on the grandest show. The contest grew in popularity as a central source of entertainment for ordinary Romans. Sensing the people's fervor and interest in the year 40 B.C., Julius Caesar held the first games that were not connected to a funeral. The games quickly grew in size, scope, and barbarity. The Romans' appetite for the games was insatiable and eventually warranted building the famous Colosseum to hold the rabid fans. The fans constantly demanded a ratcheting up of the experience's intensity. The same way that sleazy reality shows of today, somebody say amen, find new and degrading ways to bring in viewers. The gladiator games fall new twists to keep the audience interested. The games thus meticulously planned to meet the spectator's expectations. What had started as a contest between gladiators became a bizarre and bloody circus where humans were fed to animals and animals were slaughtered for fun and women and children and blind men and dwarves were made to fight to the death. Sounds like the E channel. And the only experience I have with that is when I was at risk here. And those, I don't know they're not here. Those nutty ladies were watching those stupid reality shows as I got to work. And I had five minutes of torture every Sunday night because it was, I had five minutes I had to be there until they would leave and I'd switch on Fox News. It became impossible. Even brief pauses in the action bored the crowd, necessitating the building of elaborate tunnels facilitating the entrance and the removal of warriors and animals with the least interruption possible. 
people expected to show each to show better and bloodier than the, each show to be, be uh, better and bloodier than the last. Yet the game's ever escalating intensity could not keep pace with the crowd's insatiable appetite for blood, and it became impossible for Roman rulers to keep up with the pace and the cost of these elaborate spectacles, and so the games eventually died out in the 6th century. My wife and I wanted to watch a, a video Friday night. We, we worked till dark, just about every day of the week, and we, it was Friday night, and we were determined not to, to work till dark, and we went out and got a bite to eat, and uh, took care of some business and sold by the videos. I hate going to the video store. I hate it. I like Netflix because you don't have to go and wait through those aisles trying to find yeah, trying to find a nugget somewhere. Why what's the problem? Because back in the fifties they wouldn't show Lucy and Ricardo they wouldn't show Lucy and Ricky in the same bed. And they had to have pajamas on with long sleeves because it was too risque to show anything else. Uh, and now they don't cover anything up when they show them in the movies. What happened? How did we go from that to where we are now? I'll tell you how we went. One little bit at a time. Uh, you finally got tired of Lucy and Ricky in separate beds. Uh, and they started showing them lay down in the same bed. And then it started showing them, uh, you know, they hug or kiss the night. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the details. It has taken us to where we are now. One little bit of stimulation at a time. And church, I'm here to tell you this morning, uh, as we as Christians learn how to exercise self-control in our own lives, uh, we will not make it. You'll get sucked down into the vast immorality of this world, sex and drugs uh, and excesses. I know I'm not preaching something popular. I don't know who's involved in what in this congregation. I just know God spoke to me and said, try to nail it down this morning. Uh, try to screw it down secure. Don't just hit on this or don't just hit on that. But get to the core of the issue. Uh, and the issue is, uh, if we don't have self-control in our lives, uh, the devil will pull you down. I've had pastors say what the most important thing to have or someone is going to live for God. What's the most important trait to develop? And I've heard some good answers. I've heard prayer. Now who can argue with that? I've never seen anybody backslide and pray. It just doesn't happen. I've heard people say you've got to fall in love with the Word of God. You've got to love truth. Uh, if I pray in church this morning, you hear me. If you don't have a love for truth, uh, if having the truth is not important to you, then somewhere along the line, you just mark my words, you're going to buy a lie. Because it's going to appeal to you. Who can argue with that? And some have said, church on Sunday morning, if you can't master that, you're not going to make it to heaven. Who can argue with that? You know what it all boils down to, though? I've become convinced it boils down to this fruit of self-control because with this self-control you're not going to take the time to pray. You're going to be pulled away by a movie or by a task or by a song. You're going to be pulled away by entertainment. If you don't have the fruit of self-control you're not going to take the time to read your Bible. If you don't have the fruit of self-control you're not going to make it to church. Solomon found out what we're going to find out in this world someday that pushing the envelope of desire to its limits is a losing and unsatisfying endeavor. Allow me to read this passage of scripture to you this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He said, I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this was vanity. As I've said of laughter, it is bad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I've searched my heart. How to cheer my body with wine. My heart was still guiding me with wisdom. And how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of men to do under the heavens. Concerning the few days of their life. 
I've made great works. I've built houses. I've planted vineyards. I've made myself gardens and parks. Uh, I've planted all kinds of fruit trees. I've made myself pools uh, for which to water the forest. I've, made, I've bought male and female slaves. I had slaves uh, that were born in my house. I had great possessions. Uh, uh, more than any had been before me in Jerusalem. I gathered gold. I gathered silver in the treasures of kings and provinces. Uh, I got singers, both men and women, uh, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. That was a tactful way of saying that. Thank you. He said, so I became great and I surpassed all that were before me in Jerusalem. And also my wisdom remained with me and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. And he goes on to say, then I considered all that my hands had done, the toll I expended in doing it. My own, all was vanity and striving after the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. Why? What's he saying? He's saying that that chasing for more stimulation, that chasing for more, trying to find satisfaction of the desires of your heart by always having more of something is not going to lead you to satisfaction, but it's a chasing of the wind. Have you ever tried to catch a piece of fog? It doesn't work that way. Use your brains, church. Consider your actions. Let everyone, Philippians 4 and 5 through 7, let everyone consider, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. King James' language would be, let your moderation be known among all men. Does that sound more familiar? Be considerate. Be moderate. And then he says, the Lord is coming soon. What's that got to do with it? I'll tell you what it's got to do with it. You know what? Syria is about to blow up. I really, I found myself in a discussion the other day about how do you, how do you radiate proof yourself, or uh, make yourself safe for radiation should we get into a nuclear uh, war? I don't know that there is a safe way. You know, church, hear me right now. Listen to what I'm about to say. This is why it's important. I thought about preaching on end times things this morning. My political enjoyment uh, and my enjoyment, enjoyment of end time prophecy and such things, uh, I would love to preach that, hey, Jesus is about to come. The world's about to blow up. Uh, you need to get to the altar this morning. I would have loved to have preached something like that because I enjoy those kind of topics. But can I tell you something this morning? It's important, this message, because the Lord is coming soon. He said that your moderation be known because the Lord is coming soon. Be considerate in all you do. What's he saying? Use your brains. Jesus is going to come back. Don't let yourself get caught up in anything. Consider what you're going to do. Put a filter on what you do. Can I tell you something? If God is not active in your life on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday and Saturday and the times on Sunday and Thursday that you're not in church, if God is not actively involved in your life, acting as a filter for you, you're going to have a hard time being ready when the rapture comes. Thank you, Nathan, for putting the plug in for the prophecy teaching week. A couple of Thursday nights recently, I've Shown some teachings to Brother Baxter in time uh, ministries, and uh, we're on his waiting list a year from now to have him come here. It'll be a great time when we make it happen. In the meantime, he is a very thorough prophecy teacher, and I'm trying to take one Thursday a month and show uh, a DVD uh, of him teaching. On a prophecy issue that I've tried showing things that I haven't taught on so much here the last few weeks. I think we're going to start going through just a, 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 a commentation through the book of Revelation, a commentary through the book of Revelation, uh, him teaching it, but just do it the first Thursday of each month. So if you kind of want to know what the format is, first Thursday of each month is going to be a, a prophecy teaching with Brother Baxter. But you know, he said, let your moderation be known. The end is coming. But be considerate in all you do. Why? The Lord's coming. In other words, you don't have time to mess around getting sucked down into all this world's excesses. You don't know if you're going to have time to extricate yourself. 
I don't know if I should. You know, I hesitate sometimes using references from movies and stuff, but I know everybody here watches movies and most everybody does and TV shows and at least to some degree. And so my wife, we settled on one we had heard about but hadn't uh, seen based on a book that I think both my kids had read and the book was popular for a while, but we watched Atlas Shrugged. And if you're into the political stuff, you, you, you really would have, you had got it, it was good. But there was a part that we were both very, very disappointed in because it, it didn't show nudity and it didn't show a lot, you know, a bunch of junk, but it did show a husband breaking his vow to his wife in a conscious decision. Not a heated moment of passion before he breaks his vow. He says, and back home I've got a wife. Something like that. And we both were, we started, we were very disappointed in a book that had so many positive, a movie, so many positive messages to it. It, it talked about, you know, doing your best and trying to uh, be the best that you can be and what you do and giving everything you're all. Those are good, godly attributes. But it showed him breaking his vow. Why do you bring that up right now? Because the first movie, it made it look like he got away with it. And it was Friday night and we had nothing else going on and we decided to watch the second one. We were really tired by the time the second one did it. About 11.30. We were both really tired by 11, 11.30. Y'all may just be getting cranky in the world, folks. And, uh, well, I am anyway. I guess we can get honey. And, uh, I don't know if you caught this, but he did end up paying for that. Because at the end, he, he, was, he was forced to sign away his rights to the one thing he had lived his whole life for. That was his business. And everything boiled down to the special creation he had that had revolutionized the world's economy. And finally he was undone because his wife, who knew of his infidelity and had never said anything, so she went with her power, her power and prestige, she allowed the government to blackmail him. And the, the agent went to him, and I don't know if I'm spoiling it for you, you'll see him anyway, he was blackmailed. And his infidelity did cause him to lose everything he had lost, everything he had fought for his entire life. Can I take you something, church? You don't break God's laws. And I'm paying for it somehow, some way. Why this message? Why this morning? Because God wants us to be saved. As we increase stimulation, our appetite rises to meet it. We need even more stimulation then to achieve the same pleasure. We must learn how to get control of our senses because eventually we reach the point of diminishing returns and you find yourself going into deeper and deeper levels of sin. You've got to reconnect with your senses. Boy, I'm preaching a long time this morning, aren't I? Are you still with me? Somebody say amen. You've got to reconnect with your senses. You've got to learn how to stop and enjoy the moment. You've got to realize that your attention span has been messed up. Life doesn't happen it happen instantly. You've got to realize that good things in life are meant to take time. You've got to quit multitasking and live in the moment. Let me rephrase that. At some point in time, you need to shut the radio off, shut the VCR off, shut the DVD player off, shut the earbuds off, shut off everything, whether it's talk radio, Christian radio, shut off everything around you except you and your thoughts and God. It doesn't matter if you're washing dishes. It may be that you're out building a wall. It may be that you're loading stuff in a warehouse. It may be that you're out in the garden. It may be that you're doing something, whatever. You're thinking your own thing. But we do it with the background. We drive down the road with talk radio going. I do. We drive with music going. I do. We, we do things at the same time. We're always got multiple levels of stimulation coming in and somebody else is controlling our thoughts. And at some point in time, church, hear me right now. I can't give you chapter and verse per se off the cuff right now, but I can tell you what I'm about to say is truth. At some point, you've got to learn how to hear God's voice. And you'll never do that if somebody else is speaking to you here at the same time. Maybe a little bit here, a little bit there. But God will never be able to speak to you. If you learn to wean yourself off things, take a fast for stimulation. I Lord, give me time here. Stop the sun or something. Hello. My name is Keith Duncan. And I am a diabetic. And I found myself 
24-7 with Diet Pepsi in my hand. I wake up to it in the morning and I drink it to help me go to sleep at night. This is where I was a couple of months ago. I know, maybe you don't have anything like that. But I did. And it became an awareness in my head, you know, I'm not drinking anything but Diet Pepsi. Now, for all you health nut freaks, just get off my case. I do believe you get fluids and water from Diet Pepsi. And it's, maybe it affects your blood sugar, but I've tested religiously. It doesn't affect my blood sugar. And by the way, mine is still under control without any medication right now. To God be the glory. And while we're doing praise reports, the doctor gave my new glasses last week, looked at my eyes, and didn't see any more bleeding. My eyes look good and stable. To God be the glory. But it became, became an awareness in my mind that all I'm drinking is Diet Pepsi. That's the only liquid I'm drinking. And so I made a decision. I'm going to make myself drink a glass of water a day. Just because I know I need to. And because I don't need to be under the control of anything. And so, I found myself yesterday. And my wife and I were out trying to move a, a 16 foot long shed with the SUV in getting it uprooted and moving it, jacking it up and putting rollers under it, all that kind of stuff. I was getting hot and tired and I was getting sweaty and I had some Diet Pop in the SUV and you know what else I had? I had a nice big jar of ice water sitting out there. When I got thirsty, I went to the ice water rather than the pop. Why? Because I realized I've got to train myself to go back to what's best for me. Church self-control. A fruit of the Spirit that if you have it, it'll teach you that when things start going bad, you need to go back to what's best. It'll keep you from ruining your life. I don't know. Maybe it was a silly little stupid example. But you've got to learn how to say no to the world stimulations, even if it's just for a few hours, to get to know your own thoughts. Scripture says that He will not let anything happen to us without making a way of escape. You know what that tells me? It tells me that no matter what you're caught up in this morning, if there's anybody here that's got an addiction that you can't overcome, I don't care whether it's physical stimulus, whether it's uh, something you ingest, or something you observe. Maybe you're just hooked on talk radio. Lord, I've been a junkie on that. I've had to learn how to shut it off and work with just my thoughts. Why? Is there anything wrong with Rush? No. Anything wrong with Sean Hayden? No, he just gets boring at times, but I still enjoy him so. I like Glenn Beck and the best talk show guy out there is a guy named with Joe Pags. Down to earth, common sense, substitutes for Glenn. I listen to him when he come on in and I recommend him highly. But you know what? If I have to have them speaking into my mind all the time to survive, something's wrong with my thinking. If you've got to have somebody else or something else speaking into you all the time, something's wrong with your thinking. I'm starting to wander and starting to get too far off this. Me and if you'll cut the piano. Church, God will give you what you need. The scripture says that He came that we may have life and that more abundantly. He came to give us life, not just get by, eat, get out. Life's terrible. Can I tell you something? Some of the happiest people in the world don't have anything. And this world's possessions of. But they've got a peace because they've learned how to find the enjoyment that God has in everything. And can I tell you this morning, God has a place for you this morning. Now. No matter what your place or station or status in life, God has a place for you where you can live satisfied, where you can live happy, where you can live full of the joy of the Holy Ghost. Where does it start? Keep control of yourself. I don't want to go to church this morning. I tell you what, before I ever got behind a microphone, I learned I've got to be unable to get out of bed to not be in church on Sunday morning. I've learned some things in the years. I've made my mistakes and I've failed at times. Everybody will have their own weakness. But can I tell you something this morning? God will give you victory if you'll learn to give Him the reins. 
of your life. If you learn to give Him control, He doesn't want to starve you from music. He doesn't want to starve you from things that taste good. He doesn't want to deprive you of the joys of physical intimacy. Our world has just taken these things and twisted them and perverted them and pushed them beyond the boundaries that God ever desired for them to be in. So the drunken excesses of this world and the the lewdness and excesses of immorality and I'm just going to say it time to leave it at that. All the things in this world that the devil says just a little bit more. Here, just step outside the boundaries a little bit. You know, you know just, just one time, you'll ruin your marriage over one affair. Now, don't hear me. One drink will set you down the road to drunkenness. One puff will set you down the road to an addiction that will lead you to something else into something else. Pastor, this isn't beer. It ain't gonna hurt anything. Oh, it's just a cigarette. It ain't gonna hurt anything. You know, there's a reason they're called gateway drugs. Oh, it's just marijuana. It's not gonna hurt. There's a reason it's called gateway drugs. Oh, it's just a picture. You know, it's just a picture. There, it, you know, I'm not looking at a real person. Oh, you know, it's a gateway. It's a gateway. You gotta draw some lines. What's the answer? Is it all going to be you? Can you only rely on your discipline? No. Because it says the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. That's our